How you guys doing? Who was here last week, last Sunday? We had some meaty word last Sunday. When I was told that I have to speak this week, I was just going to hit replay because that was awesome. God was speaking really in about, about forgetting who we are, about decreasing and allowing him to increase, allowing God to take the podium, take the stage. Before I speak, let's just bow down and bow our heads and let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for being here, Lord God. We believe in your word. It says where two or three gather in your name, you are there amongst them. Lord, we, we ask you, let us not just be in this, in this place in your presence, but let us receive from you, God. Let every single person individually hear your voice. Let them hear you speak into their hearts, God, and let us, all of us leave this place changed. Let us leave this place changed by you, touched by you, God. We thank you and we worship you. We submit to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I don't know if maybe some of you guys are not aware, we're going through a series called Make Jesus Famous. And so we started doing series where uh, for multiple weeks we go through these topics and different people share from what God reveals to them about that. And I really, I really enjoy that because I get to see from multiple aspects, from multiple angles, the same topic in it. And it's just been powerful. I'm excited for this series because I, I truly believe that it's our calling. That is the highest calling that we have. And Christianity is not what people oftentimes think it is. Christianity is not a formula. It's not a get rich quick scheme. It's not a get all your problems solved scheme. It's not the Bible. It's not a math book. It's not a science book. It's not somewhere where you turn to page three and you get, you get the breakdown of what happens when such and such things occur. That's not what the Bible is. Oftentimes people are led to believe that there is a formula to God. There's a formula to what I have to do, how I have to look, how I have to act, and then such and such results will arise. And on one hand, that's exactly what it sounds to be. We, we definitely have commandments. We definitely have rights and wrongs. And there are certain things we should and should not be doing. But at the same time, our God, he's a God who's interested in the relationship. He's not interested in just a math student. He's not interested in memorization. The Bible is not just a book of formulas. It is a letter written personally to you. You can't impress God by reciting all the books by heart. What impresses God is that the, the position of your heart looking at that letter. What that letter truly means to your heart. God is not moved by, by us knowing the scripture that we can quote it in and out, but judging somebody by it. God is not moved when, when, we, can, when we can quote every single page of the Bible, yet fulfill none of it. God is not interested in us living a, a really clever two-faced lifestyle. He's interested in a genuine relationship. He'd rather you be very simple, not, not do a lot, but love him earnestly, rather than do so much, have a busy schedule, and at the end of the day not know what his character is like, whether he approves or disapproves what you do. I believe that God, like any other father on this earth, is yearning for that relationship, for fellowship with you. Our God the Father wants to speak to you. Can you imagine that? Tonight, right now, he's not interested in me preaching. He's interested in talking to you. He doesn't care who's behind the mic, whether it's ben Benny Hinn, Billy Graham. He doesn't care. He's here for you. He's not here to, to hear a sermon. God doesn't need my words. He's here to speak to your heart. He's here to touch you, to tell you that he loves you, to tell you that he approves he wants certain things done, and he, he cares for you so much. Let us truly have our hearts open. Let us be able to hear what God's saying. Let's not sit through the sermon and, and just leave. Not, I'm not saying that because I'm talking. I'd rather not be talking. I'd rather be listening. But now that we're here, let us truly accept and take something from God. John 3.30, Roman read this last time. 
very short verse. John the Baptist is standing and he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. John 3.30. John the Baptist, a very, very established man of God whom the Pharisees did not like, yet respected. Whom many people didn't understand, yet wanted to hear. Hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds ran to the desert where there was nothing to see except a man in a, in a camel's skin, ungroomed, preaching the word of God. This man with a passion for Christ, with a passion for what is to come, was, was waiting for the Messiah. And as John sees Christ, as he, as he realizes that this is it, he is ready, absolutely ready to say, I am nothing and he is everything. He's absolutely ready to say, I hope nobody sees me from this point on, but I hope everybody concentrates on him. And it's incredible that this world is exact opposite. This world, where we live, our society teaches the exact opposite. Our, our society teaches us it's all about me. It's all about me. I have to be seen. I have to be known. I have to go get a good education to get a good job, to earn a little bit of money, to be above somebody else. It's about me. I want the best. I want it now. And I don't want the other person to have it. And whether you like it or not, that's exactly what's being bombarded into your life. You might say, that's not me, but I'll tell you, everything in the media, everything that this world produces, that's exactly its goal, is to center yourself on you and watch you be destroyed. Because a me-centered life will never lead to success. A me-centered life leads to one place, and that's depression. Because it's no secret that you and I, we all have flaws. It's no secret that you and I are not perfect. And we, when we focus so hard on ourselves that we don't see anything else, we see our strengths and we see our weaknesses. And those weaknesses, oftentimes the devil grabs and destroys people with their own weaknesses. He starts pointing out that, that that's not enough, that's, that's not enough. And you start seeing the vicious cycle of wanting more, of going for more and never achieving it. But John the Baptist says these revolutionary words. He says, I must decrease that he must increase. I must be unnoticed that Christ would be noticed. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul is speaking to, to the people in Rome and he's saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Offer your lives as a living sacrifice. An absolute oxymoron once again. A living sacrifice. A sacrifice is something that you bring to a deity, you bring to a king, you bring to God. It is something you offer and most often it deals with death. A sacrifice is a lamb or a goat that is brought and killed before God. And, and speaking to the Romans, the Romans knew very, very much about sacrifice. And so Paul illustrates their life and he says, bring your life as a living sacrifice. Bring your life as a living sacrifice. You see, the thought of Christianity being a solve-all solve formula breaks right here. God didn't call you to say, come here and I'll fix all your problems. Unfortunately, that's not what God, God called us for. He said, come here and be a living sacrifice for me. And you know, people turned away from Jesus when he said that. Jesus said, you want to follow me? Forget everything. Forget your family. He said, I did not come. I did not come to, to turn, or I did not come to turn the fathers to the sons. He says that, that, that you must hate your family. And there's a whole different teaching about that. And I know people say, what do you mean? Jesus said to hate. And I heard an incredible message at Pastor Savik's house where our love for Christ must be so big that any other love must look like hate compared to it. Our love for Christ must be so incredible. The fact that Christ did everything for us, we must be ready to do absolutely everything for him. And that's exactly what God demands. And Paul writes here, he says, submit your life as a living sacrifice. A sacrifice does not have a will. 
A sacrifice does not have a voice. A sacrifice does not even have a choice. Now, modern Christianity says, are, are you kidding me? I have to feel good. I have to do this and that. I have to succeed. I have to, I have to do everything right. And even, even as I read and as these thoughts processed in my mind, I started realizing how, how difficult it is to place that into my heart. That I shouldn't have a will. That I shouldn't have a voice. That I shouldn't even have a choice. That my life should be a complete sacrifice to Christ. And if I truly trust him, he is my will. He is my voice. He is my choice. The one who died for me, the one who chose me, the one who sacrificed everything. How could he not do the best for my life? But in all of this, I'd rather choose to say, Lord, I'm going to give you Sunday, Tuesday night, Friday evening at cell group, and the rest just let me live my life. And yet I'm called to make Jesus famous. I started realizing that my life is not yet a living sacrifice for God. As I prayed, as I checked myself, I asked myself, am I truly presenting myself as a living sacrifice? In all its meaning, a living sacrifice. The only difference between us and the true sacrifice should be that we stay alive. And with our life, we show the example to this world. Paul says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is our will. Our will is not to succeed. It's not to become famous, rich. Our will is to make him known on this earth. It's incredible how easily we skew that. It's incredible how easily we go away from that. And the reason for that is the devil knows that if we find that will and we truly get a hold of it, this world will start changing. The enemy invests absolutely everything he has to keep us occupied. It's, it's oftentimes very difficult to make a, a good Christian sin. It's very difficult to make most Christians just grab, grab alcohol and start drinking it. Grab drugs and start using them. It's very difficult. So the enemy goes to the next best thing. Let's keep him occupied. Let's keep him busy. We cannot live our life as a Christian, a busy Christian life, and truly be an example of Jesus. We cannot live a, a, a busy Christian life and then wonder why nothing's happening around us. Wonder why there is no power. Wonder why things feel mundane. Today more than ever before people start complaining and saying, well, where is the power? Why is the church not healing like it used to heal? Why, why are the gifts of the Spirit not working in our church? I, I'm, not, I'm not excluding myself. I ask this question myself. I said, it's interesting. I go, I've gone to missionary trips and I saw healings there, but oftentimes I can't get a healing for myself. And once again, I don't have a formula. I don't have a clear answer for you as to do this and this and this and that will happen. But what I do know is the Holy Spirit did not change. What I do know is the power of God did not grow weak. What I do know is that he is still my healer. He's still my provider. He is still my protector. He is still my savior. He is still my life. And it doesn't matter if the whole world turns against me. He's all I need. That does not change. People change. Circumstances change. This world changes. But my God is yesterday, today, and forever the same. My God is the zealous God. My God is the God that could not, could not take sin in Israel. And how can, he, how can he accept the sin in my life? How can I ask how can I ask to see more when I'm not willing to lay myself down? When I'm not willing to do something I don't want to do. I was talking to Dima just earlier today about how we live in the generation where we only, only do what we like. If I don't like it, it's not worth my time. If I don't like it, then it's not worth my time. What's funny is that just a few generations ago saying that, People would laugh at you, especially, especially a lot of the immigrants that came from, from countries with persecution. Not doing what you don't want to do, that's everything. Their lives were filled with things that they didn't want to do, yet these are, these are the people that carried revival. These are the people that, that did some of the greatest feats known to men. These are the people that sat in prisons for, for the name of Christ. These are the people whose wives would say, don't deny Christ and sit in prison, even if we're in danger. I'd rather you sit in prison for the name of Christ than, than be a coward. 
I tell you, in those days, the Holy Spirit was the same Holy Spirit that he was today. But those people were the clean vessels that were able to carry that power out. Not because they were persecuted, but because their hearts were in the right place. Because their hearts were willing to do anything for Christ. They were willing to say, I am that living sacrifice. And if I must die tonight, so be it. If we look in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, the Great Commission, very well known to all of us. Jesus turns to them and says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Jesus, as he's leaving this earth, has just a few more minutes, a, little, a few more hours, a few more days, and he decides to say this. As he's leaving, he decides to define what his command is for the rest of Christianity. It's interesting. None of the command says, come to church and sing songs. None of the commandments says, be a church member. None of the commandments even says, bring offerings. Now, all those things are wonderful things. Trust, I'm not trying to put them down. But what I'm saying is priority. Number one, and then things to follow. Our number one has to be being witnesses of Jesus Christ. Number two, three, four, five, that can be church, it can be, it can be worship, it can be a band, whatever you're part of. But number one, he says, go into all nations and preach Go and be a witness. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be witnesses to me in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Why is it? Why is it, I ask myself, that I'm able to trade that for everything else? I prefer comfort over power. I realize that. That it's a lot easier to take comfort over power. We ask God for power. You know what happened to Peter when he had power? He sat in prison. John sat, went, went onto an island, was persecuted. Ro, uh, uh, Paul, persecuted, was cast onto an island, shipwrecked multiple times, stoned to death once, eventually killed. Power or comfort. But I also know one thing, that if we do choose power, that's when we start seeing changes. Comfort never brings changes. Power does. This word, this letter of God, it is power. The Holy Spirit, it is power. None of that changed. None of that changed. If you look around and you say, well, I don't see it, it's because we're not ready. And as we prepare our hearts, as we seek and cry and ask him to do that, I believe that I believe that we will see revival. That we will see power. That we will see healings. That we will see miraculous transformations. There are so many, so many testimonies in my life that I've already seen, but they're so easily forgotten. It's interesting how the enemy, he always tries to scoop that away. As the seed is sown, the enemy is always there like a crow to pick that up and, and carry that away. Most of you have experienced God in a tremendous way. Yet for, for most of us, it's become just a memory. It's, because, it's become just something we can look back to and think about. I believe we're called to have that as a reality, to have that on a daily basis, to have that as power that follows us. In his great commission, Jesus mentions multiple things. He says that they will lay their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Serpents cannot touch them, that no harm can come towards them. That's what this world needs to see. I'm sorry if this sounds kind of dry, but I'm realizing that I have to come back to the basics in my life. I've built up so much fluff that as people poke at me, they realize it's just fluff. But Jesus calls himself a rock. He calls himself an unshakable foundation. An unshakable foundation. When we truly experience Christ, we should be in a place where no matter what storm comes against us, it may hurt, it may beat against us. He says the rains will come and the winds will come, but the house will stand. Don't be afraid of challenges. Don't be afraid of problems. It's how you deal with them that matters. Christ never promised us a, a smooth life. He promised us a life with him as the anchor. 
You see, we're not, called, we're not called to live a life with no problems. We will see problems in our families, amongst our friends, in people we care. But the difference is those who are truly Christ, those who live with him, they will go through that problem and come out stronger. They will come out out of the test with a testimony. I know that the problems in my life, not only should they not break me, but they should empower me to help somebody else. Christ is calling us to be an others-centered life. Stop, stop living for ourselves. Stop living for what matters to us, what's important to us. I'm, I'm guilty in this. I'm not judging anybody. I'm, I'm just realizing and sharing what, what God is telling me in my life, that it's time to, to brush off. It's time to reprioritize. It's time to see where I've grown slack and where I have to change. We might be 18, 19, 20 years old. And it seems like all of our life is ahead of us. It's unfortunate that it's going to seem that way up until you're laying on your deathbed. And then it's too late. But we have a choice. We have a choice. We have the right to choose to live in the spirit. We have the right to choose to sow in the spirit. We have the, the right to live a life that will be empowered. If you open Acts chapter 4 verses 13 through 16. Peter and John are standing before the Sanhedrin. Jesus is gone already. The Holy Spirit came upon the, the apostles. The church is growing. They, they're living the life that Christ called them to live. They're being witnesses everywhere they go. And they just happened to walk into the temple to worship. And there was a lame man sitting. As, as they walked by, he was asking for money. And instead they said, gold we do not have, but what we have we give to you. Rise up and walk. This man that was lame for, the, for his entire life is now walking. He's not crippled anymore. Uh, the city comes into motion. People start asking what's happening. They realize that this man they saw by that, by that city or by those gates for so long and priests and high priests walk by and nothing changed. And all of a sudden some, some two men walk by. They tell him to get up. He's walking. And the Sanhedrin realizes that they have to do something. So they call Peter and John in. They, they put him before them and they start questioning them. They start questioning them and instead of Peter and John being lost or confused because they're uneducated, because they're simple people and this is the, the, pretty much the high court they're standing in front of. They start speaking boldly and telling them about who Jesus is. They start telling them about everything that's inside of them. And at that point there was nothing, there was nothing the Sanhedrin could do to scare them off because they had nothing else inside them. They were completely living sacrifices filled with one thing and one thing alone, the love for Christ. And they start spilling that out out of just natural. They weren't preparing for it. They were ready to testify to anyone if it is the Pharisees so be it let's do it for the Pharisees if it was to that lame person that's who we'll testify to but they were so filled with one thing that nothing could stop them and at this the Pharisees look and they say and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained man they marveled and they realized they had been with Jesus and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them they could say nothing against it but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle had been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. That is the power that we're called to. You see, don't deceive yourself. The people you surround yourself with are a mirror to you. The people you surround yourself with are a mirror to who you are. They're in exact resemblance. And you might say that's not true. But I tell you, the people I surround myself with have an inevitable impact in my life. It's interesting that they started with that, that they say, these men are uneducated, simple guys. But their boldness is beyond belief. They had to have been with Jesus. Their time spent with Jesus wasn't just a good feeling for a while. They didn't just hang out with Jesus to, to feel good. But their time spent with Jesus prepared them for the time that was to come. It's interesting. How come people do not recognize that in us? The only, the only answer is we're not spending enough time with Jesus. Let's not overcomplicate things. It's not that times changed. 
It's that we choose not to spend the time with Jesus. Christians do not need, do not need a new way of worship. We do not need the worldly music to, to, to bump right, to hit just right. We do not need to make more sports, sports events to invite people to the sports so that we could trick them into hearing the word of God. We do not need a circus to come to church. All we need is more time with Jesus. All we need is more genuine time with Jesus. And when we spend that time with Jesus, when we're brought before our classmates, we will testify of Jesus. When we stand before our boss, we will testify of Jesus. When we stand before the city, we will testify of Jesus. And as we spend time with Jesus, as we walk by the lame, they will walk. As we walk by the blind, they will see. There is one simple solution to the crisis in this world as we heard this morning. It is a revival. A real revival. A revival where Jesus Christ becomes the center of the church, the center of our lives, and the light that starts shining in the darkness. It's interesting that that simple thought transcends everywhere. I know that in my life, so many people can... Can, can see that I quote my dad a lot because I spend a lot of time with him. Certain friends I have people say, oh man, you do it just like that guy. And it's because I spend, I spend time with those people. I'm hungry to see the day when people can say, you remind me of Jesus. It's interesting that you remind me of, of Jesus. And it sounds so far-fetched, but I believe that the time is coming and the time is here where Joel prophesied that he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And the young and the old and everyone in between, they will do nothing but testify of Christ. It's, it's incredible, but Jesus is coming soon, guys. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus, Christ himself, is coming soon. What will matter that day? My education? My car? My money, none of that will matter. All that will matter is how many people I was a, test, I was a testimony to. That's all that's going to matter. You know, it's funny, even going to church won't matter. It won't matter if you were part of Benny Hinn's. If you, it won't matter if you were part of Church of Truth. It won't matter. All that will matter is if your heart was like God's. If God found the heart according to himself in you. That's what will matter on that day. If we want to make Jesus famous, it's a simple solution. Become like Jesus. It's, it's incredible that everything in this world is turned to prevent us from doing that. But I've already seen in my life so many people that have taken the stand for the truth. And you see that they radiate beauty. They radiate kindness. They radiate love. And another truth that hit me recently is how much this world needs us. How much this world needs us. I get to meet very powerful people at work. I get to meet city councilors, uh, senators. Got to meet a few governors already. And all those people have one thing in common. They're lost. They're lost. As, as sad as it is. A lot of these people are beyond millionaires and they don't know how to keep their marriage together. I know a guy personally, he's very successful. He doesn't know what to do with his children. People are becoming, getting divorced. People are cheating on one another. People are lying to each other. Living two-faced lives. And there is no answer in this world. But there's one who showed how to love, who showed how to care, who showed the pure life. He says, the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what we're called to live by. I tell you, you will not be disappointed if you don't ever earn six digits in this world. But you will be disappointed if not a single person heard about Christ through you. For sure. One of the greatest examples to me 
is this old lady that, that died uh, a few years ago. Her name is Dusya Lavrentyevna. She was, yeah, funny name to start with, right? Dusya Lavrentyevna. This woman shocked me completely. She died at, I believe it was 84. I think she was 84 when she died. Uh, she wasn't married. Obviously didn't have kids. Didn't have a brother or sister. Didn't have parents alive already at the time. So she was completely, she was orphaned very, very early on in her life. I don't remember how she came to Christ. But she moved to the, she moved to the United States. Once again, I was young. I don't remember how. I was about, when she moved and moved in with us, I was about nine years old or eight years old. And I, I've testified about her so many times already because that, that woman just changed the way I see Christianity. This old lady that to me was of no interest whatsoever. And I was annoyed that she was living with us because I had to sleep in the living room. I was frustrated. She took my room and she would take out her dentures and drop them everywhere. And it wasn't a good story. But what shocked me, what shocked me, is how many people kept coming to our house for this old lady. And it wasn't to help her. It was to receive help from her. She was almost 80 years old at the time. And she lived with us for, I think, a year and a half. And just, I'm not exaggerating, every single day, every single day somebody would come to our house. Not to see us, to see this Dusya, Dusya Lavrentyevna. I'm telling you, every single day, that people would come. Baptists would come, Pentecostals would come, Charismatics would come, church leaders would come. And she would just keep praying and praying and praying. And she could spend, she could spend an hour with one person. That person would leave, the next person would come. She would spend the next hour. Doesn't need lunch, doesn't need, uh, maybe that's why she died. The, just this woman's crazy. Loved people so much. Loved people so much. But what's interesting is how many lives she impacted. She impacted. She didn't have a car. She didn't have a cell phone. She didn't have the internet. And this woman impacted. I can't count. I'm not exaggerating. In that year, if, if all she did was that year and a half, I wish I could do that much. But that was just a year and a half of her life that I got to see. As this woman passed away, the church Sloamita was jam-packed. For an 84, 83 year old woman, didn't have any relatives, was never married, packed, that the place was packed because how many people she was able to influence. And I asked myself that question why? She wasn't attractive, she wasn't funny, there was nothing special about her, but there, there was one extremely special thing she had the heart of Christ, she was a witness. She let the Holy Spirit come over her and become that witness that she was called to be. She was not able to keep silent. She would come out and say funny things like, Oh, Valodia, дай я тебя покормлю. My dad's like, no, I'm full. She's like, да нет, словом Божьим. And you realize that that's all she lived by. I'm telling you, my dad likes to eat, but man, she kept feeding him the word. <laughs> Good woman. I'm telling you, and that's all she lived by. This woman had this incredible, incredible drive for God. She spent so much time with Christ that she couldn't wait to go home. I don't, she wasn't really sick when she died. She just kind of left. She was fine, honestly. I, I don't know why she died. She, she just died. But she was ready to go. She's such an example to so many people, including myself. And I, I'm realizing that the solution there is simple. Be like Christ. You can have a job. You can have an education. You can live in a good place as long as you're like Christ. But if at any point, any of that changes priorities, you're in the wrong. I don't, I don't think Christ is against success, but he is against success going ahead of him. In the word it says very clearly, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all else will be added onto you. Tonight I challenge you to allow the Holy Spirit to check your heart and, re and, and check yourself if we're truly living sacrifices for God. If we're truly those people that live by nothing except Him. Let's get up to our feet. God, I thank you. I thank you for your presence. 
I thank you for your power. I thank you for what you do, Lord God, and what you've done. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, that you allow us to be witnesses to you, God. We want to make you famous in one way and one way alone, to be like you. We want to spread your love. We want to spread your salvation. We want to speak about you. We want to breathe you. We want to, talk, to, to be like you, God. Let nothing else in our life become priority except you. And I pray, God, tonight, convict every single heart, every single heart that's left that as a priority. God, you speak to the church in the book of Revelations and you say, I have one thing against you. You've left your first love. Tonight, God, we ask you restore that first love in our hearts. God, restore that desire to be the witness. Restore that desire to testify. Restore that desire to spread the kingdom. God, not just on Sunday nights, not just on Tuesday nights, not just on Friday nights. God, but every single day in our life, God, every moment we wake up, let us desire to encounter you. Let us spend time with you, God. Let us be genuine in, in our desire to spend more and more time with you. Lord God, we don't want anything else in this life. We don't want success. We don't want finances. We don't want fame. But we want to know you. We want to know you, God. Let our hearts turn to you completely. God, teach us to be living sacrifices. Teach us not to conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds, God. Let us not allow this world to influence us, but let us influence the people around us, God. Let us glow brighter and brighter as the darkness gets darker and darker, God. As sin increases, let your grace increase in our life, God. Let us be able to walk bold, stand tall, speak loud, God, and show your love, God. Let us forget about our feelings, forget about our plans, forget about what we want to do next, and remember what you want us to do, God. Remember what we should do for someone else. Remember, Lord God, the love that you came and spread. We ask you, Lord. Let us learn to be like you. God, tonight, let us stand before your altar, God, and present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you. God, cleanse us to be pure vessels that are able to carry your presence. God, if we have sinned in our life, we repent tonight. We repent tonight, God. We stand before you asking your blood to wash us clean. Forgive us, God, for the sin and let us be pure vessels in your hands. God, we don't want to be remembered for our clever words, but we do want to be remembered for sharing you. We don't want to be remembered for our success, but what we do want to be remembered for is how many people we were able to testify to, how many people were able to encounter you through us, how many people received sight though they were blind? How many people were able to walk though they were crippled? How many people were restored when their hearts were broken as they, as they encountered you through us? God, we want to be tools in your hands. Tools that are ready for every good work that would never grow tired of or weary of doing good but would desire to spread your kindness, would desire to do even things that don't feel good for us. God, we want to be the people that you can always rely on. We want to be the people that you can look down and send. We want to be like Isaiah that says, I will go for you. Here I am. Send me, God. Send me even if I don't want to. I want to do your will. I want to speak your word. I want to desire what you desire. God, let us make you famous. Let us make you known on this earth. God, let us decrease and you increase. Let us be transparent and let people see right through us and see you. Let people see right through us and see your heart, see your kindness, see your love, see your mercy, see your grace, God. I ask you, forgive us. Forgive us for making an agenda of our own for doing things that we think are right instead of what you tell us is right. We are here tonight, God, and we ask you, work with us. Work with our hearts. Work with our hearts, God.